Good Easter morning, friends. Good Easter morning, church. Good Easter morning. And welcome. Welcome one and all. Welcome to what is the most joyous day of our calendars, where we with where we proclaim with loud and triumphant voices that our Lord, who three days ago was crucified on a cross and who was laid in a grave, walks out of the tomb this day, the victor the Lord, the King, and our risen Savior. It is such a joy to be with you. It is such a blessing to be back, especially this Sunday on Easter morning. And I want to just once again, from the bottom of my heart and the heart of my family, to thank you all for your love and your prayers and your overwhelming support and incredible generosity as we welcomed Luke, the new adi newest addition to our family. <laughs> and thank you, Barry and Jeanette, Susan and Scotty for bringing the word and leading the worship in my absence. It is very appreciated. Now, as we begin, far be it from me on this incredible day to make it about myself, but there is one fitting thing that I thought I'd share, if I may. The last Sunday was Palm Sunday, and we were home, and I was taking the time to explain to my daughters what Palm Sunday was, and of course, what Holy Week was, and Good Friday, and Easter, and as I was explaining it to them, I remembered a certain song that helped me understand when I was a child. It was a song that was written and sung by Rob Evans. Some of you, if any of you remember him, may know him best as his stage name, The Donut Man. <laughs> anyone remember The Donut Man? Well, besides my family, anyone? Just us, The Donut Man? Well, I showed them this video, I showed them this song, and then as frequently happens when you show something to small children, they want to see it and they want to listen to it again and again and again and again. <laughs> and so during the week leading up to today, at any point if you walked into my house, you could have heard the words being sung, Jesus is alive, shout Hosanna. From the mouths of babes, as it says in Psalm 8, or I guess in this case, from the mouth of the donut man and then from the mouth of babes. But that joyous and simple phrase that was being sung is what we are here this morning proclaiming. Jesus is alive. Shout Hosanna. Hosanna is a Hebrew word which at one point, a long time ago, it was a cry and it was a plea for help for deliverance. It was a cry for salvation. But over time, it evolved gradually into a shout of praise. It evolved into an exaltation. Not a plea for salvation, but a declaration that salvation had come. In other words, Hosanna, Hoshiana, was once a cry that said, Save, please but now means salvation is here. Jesus is, friends, alive. Shout, Hosanna. Shout that salvation has come. Shout that victory has been won. On Friday, we gather together in a spirit of somber recognition of the price that was paid, the cost, of our sin as Jesus was nailed to and was hung on a cross to die and laid alone in a tomb. The lights of the sanctuary and the candles were put out one by one that night until there was darkness. But you know, Easter is the fullest manifestation, I think, 
of the expression that things aren't always as they seem. Because while it seemed that evil had taken the day, while it seemed like the powers of force and forces of wickedness and darkness had claimed their prize that night, while it seemed that death had its victory, things were not as they seemed. And the death of Jesus was the death of death itself. And not the victory, but it was the defeat of all those principalities and all those powers that rose up against Jesus and that sought to destroy us forever. This morning, we light the candles again because things were not as they seemed. We light the candles because the light came into the world and we acknowledge this morning that the darkness did not overcome it. So in that, let us now join together in our Easter proclamation and our celebration of light as the candles which were extinguished are now brought to burn and to shine forth once again. Rejoice, heavenly powers. Sing, choirs of angels. Exalt all creation around God's throne. Jesus Christ, our King, is risen. Sound the trumpet of salvation. Rejoice, O Holy Church. Exalt in glory. The risen Savior shines upon you. Let this place resound with joy, echoing the mighty song of all God's people. This is the day when Jesus Christ broke the chains of death and rose triumphant from the grave. Day truly blessed when heaven is wedded to earth and we are reconciled to God. Rejoice from heavenly powers, sing choirs of angels. Jesus Christ, our King, is risen. This is the day when the light of Christ rises in glory overcoming the darkness of sin and death. May the candles we light be a pillar of fire that glows to his honor. May the morning star, which never sets, find this flame still burning. Christ, that morning star, who came back from the dead and shed his peaceful light on all creation. The Son who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. 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 Would you rise now as you are able? Let us continue in our worship with proclaiming triumphantly hymn number 302, the first four verses. Christ the Lord is risen today.
please join me in the Easter prayer. Almighty God, through your only Son, you overcame death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life. Grant that we who celebrate our Lord's resurrection by the renewing of your spirit, arise from the death of sin to the life of righteousness. Raise and exalt us, O Savior, both now to the estate of grace and hereafter to the state of glory, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign, one God, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and our minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. The Old Testament lesson comes from Isaiah chapter 25, verses 6 through 9. The Lord of heaven's armies will hold a banquet for all the nations on this mountain. At this banquet, there will be plenty of meat and aged wine, tender meat and choicest wine. On this mountain, he will swallow up the shroud that is over all the peoples, the woven covering that is over all the nations. He will swallow up death permanently. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from every face and remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. Indeed, the Lord has announced it. At that time, they will say, look, here is our God. We waited for him and he delivered us. Here is the Lord. We waited for him. Let's rejoice and celebrate his deliverance. The New Testament lesson comes from Hebrews chapter 2, verses 10 through 17. For it is fitting for him, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For indeed, he who makes holy and those being made holy all have the same origin. And so he is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. Again, he says, I will be confident in him. And again, here I am with the children God has given me. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he likewise shared in their humanity, so that through death he could destroy the one who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and set free those who were held in slavery all their lives by their fear of death. For surely his concern is not for angels, but he is concerned for Abraham's descendants. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers and sisters in every respect, so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in things relating to God, to make atonement for the sins of the people. Here ends the readings. May God add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. Would our ushers come forward at this time that in response to that word we might receive and give thanks over our offering.
great and awesome God, Lord of life, crowned with glory and majesty. With the rising of the sun, you raised Jesus Christ from the grave where he lay. And by delivering him, you delivered us. We praise you on this glorious morning for all your bountiful gifts of love and of new life. Except now we pray as a token of our gratitude, of our love and appreciation, the gifts, the offerings and sacrifices that we bring and offer before you now. May they be used according to your good and perfect and gracious will to shine your light and to proclaim the life and resurrection in Christ the Lord. Amen. <laughs> <coughs> you may be seated. Singing our next hymn, number 322, Up from the Grave He Arose.
Well, friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, we have arrived again to that wonderful moment to Easter Sunday, to hear, to celebrate, to remember this incredibly momentous, cosmic, cataclysmic moment in time, one that splits time itself, one that fulfills prophecy, a moment that brought exceeding joy to those who witnessed it 2,000 years ago and is no less joyful for us here this morning. The moment where the tomb of Jesus lay empty and death itself lies in the grave, defeated and powerless. On Good Friday, we heard the dreadful proclamation of Christ's passion and his crucifixion. We heard of the suffering and the agony. We heard the humiliation that he endured willingly, at the end of which he, the Lord of life, bowed his head and proclaimed, it is finished. It is Easter Sunday, the resurrection of the Lord of life to life is the very validation of those words spoken by Jesus on the cross. It is God's amen to it is finished. It has long been said that if Good Friday is the purchase where on that dreadful cross our sins were atoned for, our punishment has been paid in full, then Easter Sunday and the empty tomb is the receipt of that purchase. It is not only because the Lord died, but that he lives, that we have the hope that we do, that we have life and life abundant, and that we confidently wait life eternal. This morning we will turn to the Gospel of John for his account of that very moment, a moment that began not with rejoicing but with great sorrow, a moment that begins not leaping for joy and singing but with tears and sadness until what we know that Christ lives is revealed to those who witnessed it. Before we turn to that great story, that powerful scripture, let us turn to the Lord in prayer, asking that we might be made receptive to that glory of the word that is set before us. Let us pray. Lord, what a wonderful, beautiful, blessed day it is to be gathered together as your people in your great name. We thank you for the blessing of Easter. We thank you for the hope and for the life that it gives. And now, Lord, as we turn to the scriptures, as we turn to your word to hear this glorious news, grant us your spirit. Make us receptive. Make us ready to receive it fully and so be filled with the joy that it brings. And guide me, Father, in my words, that I may be a vessel and a servant, effectively proclaiming your gospel, your redemption, your salvation to your people. We ask this in the name of our risen Lord, who is Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Turning now to the Gospel of John, 20th chapter, we're going to begin verse, with verses 1 through 10. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloth lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloth lying there and the face cloth 
which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We begin with Mary, of course, key player in the resurrection story, who, based on the synoptic accounts of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, was likely accompanied that morning by a handful of other women who had all gone to the tomb together to bring spices, expecting to anoint the body or the corpse of Jesus. What was a rather costly gesture. And this was, of course, all still within days, and it was in the traditional period of mourning and bereaving. So she went there to lament, not just to anoint the body, but to mourn over the body. And here she is then thrown into this tragic state of grief when upon arriving to it, she finds something deeply troubling that the stone to the tomb was not in its rightful place, but had been rolled away. Now, these stones were rather large, likely a few feet high and wide. They would be shaped like a disc. And there's often a rut in the front of the grave from where that stone sat, so it would typically require a couple of men or a handful of men at times to move them. In fact, if we go to... Mark's account, chapter 16, the women on traveling there actually ask the question among themselves, who will roll away the stone for us? So imagine there, imagine Mary's surprise when they get there and someone has already done so. And moreover and worse, the tomb is empty. Somebody has taken the body of the Lord she loved. The body, the Lord whose body she traveled all this way in respect to anoint and to preserve. Stolen by a grave robber, maybe. Or taken by the religious leaders. Or maybe Joseph of Arimathea who gave the grave to Jesus. Maybe he he had a change of heart. Maybe he changed his mind and ordered the body of Jesus to be removed. We can only speculate and we can only wonder what was racing through her mind at this moment. We can imagine her thinking that Jesus had suffered enough and now insult was being added to all of it by removing his body from its resting place. We don't know exactly what she thought except that it was stolen, but the one thing she clearly didn't think was that he had risen. Understand, friends, just as we talked about in the months leading up to today, that the Jewish people and the disciples, they were not expecting or anticipating in any way a suffering and dying Messiah. And just as they did not expect that, they did not anticipate a risen Messiah. Despite of how often Jesus had foretold of it to them. But the idea of this kind of personal resurrection of a man being raised from the grave on his own power, that idea and that concept was found nowhere in Judaism. This simply is not something that would ever have been conceived of in the minds of the disciples. Remarkably, they had witnessed and they had seen Jesus raise raise others from the grave, from death, and yet it did not occur to them, but by that same power, he himself could be raised. So this being, of course, the farthest thing then from her mind, Mary, leaves and runs to tell the other disciples. My last week before break, we looked at the very two disciples that show up in our scripture passage today, that of Peter 
And the disciple who is unnamed in this passage, but is, of course, the disciple John. And that same John, known as the beloved disciple, later known as John the Evangelist, is the same John who wrote this account, who wrote this gospel. And I've always enjoyed how he makes sure to include in his telling of the story that he beats Peter to the tomb. Very nice of him to make sure he included that detail in there. But I also enjoy what Matthew Henry says here, that while John could outrun Peter, Peter could outdare John. Because while John stops short of entering the tomb, Peter, upon arriving after John, enters right into it. Now, Jewish law and rabbinic law had very many and strict rules regarding things like that, regarding entering a tomb, regarding corpses and defilement. And Peter, as we have come to expect, from him and even admire in a way, he doesn't stop in that moment to consider any of that. It's the farthest thing from his mind. Peter and John, they see the stone rolled away. They enter the tomb. They see not only an empty tomb, but the linen cloths folded neatly in such a way that begins to cast a large shadow of doubt of what they had been thinking begins to cast a lot of doubt on Mary's theory of a stolen body. No grave robber would take the body, the corpse, and leave the cloths, which covered in the very hefty amount of myrrh and aloes given by Nicodemus, those cloths would have been worth a considerable amount of money. And nobody in their right mind wanting to steal the body or wanting just to move the body would take the linen cloths off of it first. The details that John gives us here paint a picture where the linens lay right where the body did. As if those linens once covered, or the body that those linens once covered simply passed through them, leaving them right where they were. So you see all the ideas that were running through their mind and all the theories are now beginning to come undone. Because the scene that these disciples arrive to has not even a hint of robbery. And neither does robbery even begin to make any sense. Who would have done it? The Pharisees, the religious leaders, they had guards standing at the tomb to make sure the body didn't go missing. They had no interest in having it moved, but rather making sure that it stayed put. Again, grave robbers wouldn't have taken the body and just left the linens behind. And anyone wanting to transport the body would have left those linen cloths wrapped around it. So met with this scene, met with these facts, John tells us that upon seeing this, upon entering the tomb, he began to now believe. But that he did not believe until this moment because, verse 9, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. What is meant by this is that they did not believe without seeing, just as Thomas they didn't recall Jesus' words. They didn't begin to just understand the scriptures when Mary came to them to tell them. It was now, when they see it, when they are met with no other alternative, when no other plausible theory stands, it's then that they begin to believe. And believe what exactly, we don't know. But the gears in their minds were beginning to turn. The lights were coming on. The truth was beginning to dawn on their hearts. You know, another popular Easter saying or maxim is that the stone 
was rolled away not to let Jesus out, but to let others in. Of course, that's true. Later, Jesus appears to the disciples behind the locked doors. And certainly the same Jesus who had stood on water and who had calmed the seas, who cured the sick, who raised the dead, certainly that same Jesus could very easily transport himself to the other side of some lousy stone. Now the stone was rolled away for this moment for Peter and John and the disciples to enter in. The stone was rolled away for the whole world to peer inside and to see and to believe. It was rolled away to discredit and to disprove the skeptics and the naysayers. To stand as a monument for all time of truth and of revelation that Jesus Christ was dead and now is alive, that he was crucified but is now resurrected. There still remains much mystery at the end of verse 10 where we stopped. They have seen the stone rolled away. They have seen the empty tomb. They have seen the folded linen cloths. His body was gone. He was gone. But where was he? And there's still someone else in this story. The key eyewitness of Easter Sunday who at this point has not yet come to the same understanding and belief of these two men Peter and John Mary heartbroken still struggling still very confused does not and in fact cannot out of her inspiring and incredibly powerful love for her master she simply cannot do as those two did and return home so thank God the story doesn't end there it doesn't end with verse 10 the disciples went back to their home we pick up with Mary at verse 11 in what has to be one of the most affectionate one of the most powerful moments in all of scripture and in fact in all of human history but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Weeping, Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener. She said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher Jesus said to her do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to the father but go to my brothers and say to them I am ascending to my father and your father to my God and your God Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her Mary Magdalene, disciple, of course, had begun following Jesus fairly early on in his ministry after being released by the power of Jesus from her demon possession. Jesus saved her life. Jesus gave her new life, freed her from that bondage, and she followed him since that day. And this woman, this Mary she had and she shows a love for Jesus that I think is, in a way, unparalleled. And this love that she has keeps her at the tomb to mourn what she lost, to mourn his death, and now to mourn her inability to express her love by tending to his body. 
two angels appear, attempt to comfort her. Woman, why are you weeping? And either failing to recognize that they were angels or simply being too stricken by the grief and sorrow to even care much, she responds only with what she was still at this point convinced was true. Somebody had taken the body of her Lord. So the angels, these servants and messengers of God, are at this point of no comfort to Mary. And so, the king of angels, the resurrected Lord himself and the flesh standing behind her, he then asks her the same question, now followed by another, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Now let me just pause Right there, friends, because that is the question, isn't it? Whom are you seeking? The question, that question, the answer to that question is the most consequential of all. Whom or what are we seeking? It's the same question that Jesus poses actually in the beginning of John, the first chapter. When two of John the Baptist's disciples begin following Jesus, he turns to them and he asks them, what are you seeking? Of course, Jesus has promised that all who seek shall find. And we know that God as sovereign and as the loving God, he will reveal himself to all who embark honestly and sincerely on that search. We know that nobody who knocks on that door will ever be turned away. But if you are seeking him as a mere teacher of ethics or a teacher of morality as a man, you may not truly find him. If you are seeking him only as just a giver of gifts and of blessings, you may not truly find him. And in the case of Mary, if you seek him among the dead in an empty tomb, you will not find him. But if you seek him as he is, if you seek a risen, living, reigning Savior, it's not even just that you will find him, but that you will be found by him. He will be there for all who do so, just as he did for Mary in our passage, calling them by their name. Mary, Jesus says. Mary, her name, that's all it takes. And confusion is then turned into revelation, seeking is turned into finding, and sorrow is turned into rejoicing. Just as Jesus said it would in John 16, 20, you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. In John 10, verse 27, my sheep hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Mary, a sheep, hears his voice, and it's enough. It's enough. She knows him. He knows her. And her sorrow is turned into joy. Mary is given such a joy that could never be taken from her, and she would receive eternal life through him and never perish. But not only her, but all who have done likewise, all who have gone to the empty tomb, seen that it is empty, and who have come to believe and understand that Christ is, is alive, that Christ is risen. Same gift is given to all who confess with their lips and believe in their heart that he was dead, but now lives forevermore. Mary, so overtaken by this joy, she is so captivated by the sight of her Lord that she lays a hold of him 
probably throwing herself at his feet, desiring just to never let go again, desiring to never have to be apart again from her Lord. But she could not cling to him because his physical appearance on earth was going to come to an end. And she could not continue to hold on to his body the way that she had been doing. But she would have to learn to live without his physical presence and abide in him by the Spirit. But there's another reason. Mary could not stay and Mary could not cling to him because she had an important job to do. She, in this moment, had the most glad tidings the most joyous message, the gospel, the good news to bring and to proclaim. She had seen the Lord, and she must now go and tell, she must now go and make it known. And during that, we arrive at a very important detail. It's probably very often overlooked in something profound that really gets to the heart of the Easter message. Earlier in the Gospel of John, 15th chapter, Jesus, for the first time, calls his disciples friends. He says, I no longer call you servants, but friends. Now, these friends had between that moment and now Those friends have denied him. They have abandoned him. They have forgotten his teaching. They have forgotten his words. You think if ever there was a time to make new friends, this would be it. They've proved themselves unworthy. You didn't stick by my side. You didn't believe the words that I spoke to you. I'm going to procure for myself a new group of disciples. I'm going to get myself a new group of friends. But instead of that, upon returning, now, for the first time ever, Jesus calls those very people not servants, not even friends, but what? He calls them brothers. For the first time, he calls them brothers. His instructions to Mary Go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Deniers, deserters are here by the Lord called brethren, called family. And this is the divine benefit And this is one of the blessings of Easter, what was accomplished first on the cross and then fully brought to completion in the resurrection. It is that those who prior had no right whatsoever to call themselves children of God are now called children of God. The language Jesus uses here is careful. Notice that Jesus does not say, I'm ascending to our Father and our God. I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, my God, and your God. Augustine writes that, of course, Jesus is a son of God by nature. We are sons of God by grace. It's not, of course, that we share the same communion and same relationship and same harmony as exists between the Father and Son, but rather that in the Son and in Christ, we are treated as children. We are sons and we are daughters of the Most High God. We cry out, Abba, Father, and we are heard as a father responds to a crying child. We are loved by the Father as a father loves his children, and even more so, we are adopted into the family of God. Easter means that we have been made brothers and sisters of the true Son of God. And so in that, his Father has become our Father. 
on that day, Resurrection Sunday, and since that day, deniers are called brothers. Sinners are called saints. Because though we have betrayed our Lord, we have grieved Him in our falls, and we have grieved the Holy Spirit, though we have all at times in our lives abandoned Him, failed to follow Him, though we have all at times failed to be obedient, and we have all fallen short, though it was our very sin that drove the nails, that caused Him to die that dreadful death on that dreadful tree, despite all of that, we who are in Christ, we who are called by name, and we who hear his voice are his sheep, and we are brothers and sisters to Christ, making us children of the Heavenly Father. That's what Easter means. That's the weight, that's the beauty, that's the power, that's the significance of the resurrection. It is the sure and it is the certain sign of the reconciliation that has taken place between God and man, between heaven and earth, that the punishment was paid, our sins have been atoned for, that the acceptable offering for sin, for sin has been presented, and it is proven, proven beyond any shadow of a doubt by the empty tomb. So that empty tomb, friends, is our foundation. That empty tomb is where our seeking comes to its end because he has sought and found us. That empty tomb is where our sorrow is turned into joy and where death is turned into our victory. Because the day that Jesus rose to live is the day that death died. It will still, of course, come for us all. Death always does. But just as it didn't and just as it could not hold Jesus, it can no longer hold us who are in Christ. It has no dominion. It has no power. We follow Christ. We follow him into death. We enter that tomb. We are baptized into his death. And then we walk away. Walk away alive forever, just as he did. We walk away never to die again. Romans 6, 5, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Because he is risen, we too shall rise. Because he lives, we too shall live and live forever. Because his was a physical bodily resurrection, our bodies will likewise be resurrected to glory. Because, as Colossians 3 says, he is reconciling all things to himself in creation, that he has made peace by the blood of the cross. Because of that, all things in heaven and earth will be restored. And we who are in Christ will one day with those resurrected bodies inhabit a resurrected new earth. One that is cleansed of sin, that is cleansed of sorrow, free of death where God will wipe away every tear. Because he is king and reigns as king, we will live and reign forever with him in his glorious kingdom. Because the tomb is empty, we who were lost are found. And in being found, we have hope. Our future, our eternal future, is secured. What Easter means, friends, what the empty tomb and the resurrection proves is that death now has no dominion. Death now has no sting. 
It has no victory for those who have put their trust in the Lord. It means that we have been set free. We have been set free. Free from sin. Free from its power. <clears throat> free from evil. Free from death itself. Free to live forever with Christ. In Christ. Easter means Jesus is alive. And so are we. Shout Hosanna. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, <clears throat> Lord of life and our great Savior, with your Son being lifted on that cross, you have drawn us to you. By raising him from the grave, you have given us life abundant and life <coughs> eternal. You have restored to us all that was lost through sin, and you have opened to us the gate of everlasting life. Lord, this day we celebrate you, your acts of incredible love and boundless grace and mercy. May we walk through this life in life abundant as victors in Christ, glorifying you and praising you all the days of this new life that you have given us. And may we praise you in the eternal life you have promised us and that awaits us. May the joy that comes with Easter it comes with resurrection forever be on our hearts. And may the praise of you forever be on our lips. Grant, Lord, that we would be a people who live out this truth, who live out our confessions, who live out our faith, so that by word and deed we would be witnesses of your great love. In the name of the one who rose victorious from the grave, who ascended to you to reign as king, we lift this to you in his name, Jesus Christ the Lord, praying as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Romans chapter 10 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So then let us join together in doing just that, confessing with our lips, with our Apostles' Creed, number 881. If you would rise as you are able. I believe.
Let us now join together in our closing hymn, Because He Lives, number 364 in your hymnals. peace, life, and salvation, who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep and our brother, and the grace of him who now lives and reigns forever as king, and his indwelling presence through the Holy Spirit, fill your hearts with rejoicing, keep you and strengthen you and remain with you always. Go in joy, go in peace. Go in proclamation and happy Easter. Happy Easter.
peace to everybody.